Vietnam and took them out, put them on, six of them went out. We talked to a public forum on the campus. I think that's very exciting work. I wasn't in that, but that was in my classes when it got started. It, goes it still goes today. Does it? It's composed of students who are there as yeah, students. Uh, and uh, they give presentations or answer questions or? Yeah, they'd give a presentation and they'd be subject for ridicule and questioning for the rest of their period on stage. And like Some of the war colleges run just like it is today. I mean, the curriculum is a little bit different today, but they had the seminar groups there, you know, and I'd made a rule that I would never ask a question in the big sleep room when I went into the lectures, so I stuck to that rule all year long, never asked a question. When it came time for, I was a uh, seminar leader of the last go around, National Strategy Seminar, and uh, <coughs> George Hardesty was a colonel at the time, stationed on the faculty up there, and I knew George. And so when the first speaker came up, he was the Under Secretary of State, the Honorable. You, Alexis Ball, or somebody like that, who was the Under Secretary of State at the time. And uh, Hardesty was managing the questions from the <laughs> big deck up there as they do today. The light comes up on the, when you punch the button, the light comes up on the podium, tells you who's asking a question. So he looks up there and says, Okay, illuminate your lights. Of course, I point out what they find. He said, The first questioner is uh, Colonel Thurman. <laughs> Because he knew I'd been playing this game all the time. Of course, I didn't have a question. I mean, I had no idea what the question. So I said to him, Mr. Secretary, you stated in your uh, lecture to us that uh, it would be better off if the U.S. military could carry out objectives and get it done and you know, get this war terminated and all that kind of stuff. And I said, you're, you're in the State Department, so my question to you is, how do you keep us out of wars like that? He's, he's walking by his way. Say I, I didn't know what to do. I said, I tried it over again. I said, your job is to keep us, is to settle things by negotiation, keep us out of wars. What is your, what is your way to get us out of Vietnam as opposed to us fighting over there interminably? I mean, he'd been critical of us, and that's right, tried to turn the table. Of course, everybody looked around and said, it's the first time I've ever seen this guy. <laughs> So uh, I almost sneaked through without ever asking a question. So the uh, got to know a lot of people in the class. It's a good class. I got I was in the BOQ up there, which was uh, five of us in the BOQ, and I got thrown out by the major general in charge of. The Commandant came in and said, I like your house better than the house I'm living in, so threw us all out. And I recall sitting there on a Saturday morning and he came in with his wife unannounced. And uh, he said, I was there in my shorts and reading my books. And the rest of the guys had gone back to Washington and Roadrunners. I said, can I help you, General? He said, yeah, I came in to uh, survey the house. So I took him off to the house. So the next Tuesday, I got a call from the building office, told me to evacuate the building. Of course, I was in school. He said, evacuate your quarters because the uh, commandant is going to refurbish it and move out. And so I went over to the building office later in the day and I said, I'll tell you what. I am not going to go and look for an apartment. And I'm not going to pack up anything. I'm a student here. And I'm going to class. And I moved up here before school started. And I have no intention of doing anything like that. Now, if you want to move me out of that building, you go find me an apartment. And you rent it. You get my gear, my clothes, you pack it up, 
you move it over and you unpack it and hang up the clothes, hang the pictures up. When you get that done, I'll be happy to move into it. Because I'm a full-time student here. I've got time for it. So they did that. And uh, he, <clears throat> he could have saved a lot of grief, you know, if he'd have come in and done that in sort of a gentlemanly fashion. But it was interesting that he never invited, he and his wife never invited the five of us ever to come into that house. So you can understand I have an enormous amount of respect for that. Who was it? Remember that? No. Uh, he later left that job and went back down to the Delta and became the, the three field force commander down in the Delta area. Major General's built. Uh, he was a confidant of General Westmoreland's and uh, went back down and did that job. Since then, all the commandants have lived in the house and they all, I think staff has put a plaque up there at some point. This is the Thurman room or whatever the hell it is. Because have you ever been in that house? No. It's a pretty big house. Has some great rooms in it. Stone. And uh, spent about forty thousand dollars rehabbing it. Wasn't, it wasn't really fit to live in with the, when we were in there as bachelors, but they fixed that up nicely and it's been very nice. Jack Merritt's lived in it, all kinds of guys lived in it. So it's a very nice house. And they had five bedrooms upstairs and one each one of us took one of those bedrooms and my furniture became the sitting room and the dining room furniture and the thing. Then we had some government furniture in there, but it was sort of a curiosity getting thrown out of the BOQ as you enter school by the commandant. Sort of one of those things that makes you feel prideful about your commanders. Well, you know, it's funny. It's so predictable and in character with the Army that used to be. Well, he could have done that during the summer, you follow me? Oh, absolutely. And also he could have been gentlemanly about it, and also he could have invited you over, and also he, you know, could yeah, have... Sort of screw you, Jack. You know. Yeah, I got mine. The hell with you. Uh, but it, it's not taking care of your troops. It's sort of like the battery commander didn't get you yeah, to school. Yeah, sort of wasn't time. interested. You weren't interested. You said you got to know a lot of interesting people. I kind of gather that you took some pains to be sure that you didn't get too well known yourself in any particular any depth. And uh, that was a very interesting. So I read this in the uh, out brief, and I thought, hmm, that uh, sounds like a very wise and prudent move. I never, never, never to give one. Yeah, to, because of the, she said was that uh, people who would have to make judgments about you in the future were there as your classmates, possibly. Uh, do I, am I following your drift correctly? There? No, I think there. I think that any time you assemble two hundred people, that you can get a bunch of spring butts. Yeah, and so. I think that I was a uh, formative uh, guy in a seminar room. And so, and, and we rotated seminars a number of times. But, but to get up and uh, take on the instructor and all that was my game in a uh, great sleep room where all 200 people gathered in there. Because it, it wasn't a question of having people judge me. It was a question of, I don't need the, uh, I don't need the aggrandizement. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't, it wasn't shy and reticent on my part. It's the fact that I don't, I don't need to do that for the purpose of getting some notoriety here in the uh, classroom. I'd rather, I'd rather work my way in through it in a smaller group where some counts, in other words. But they're a group of guys, I could have counted you ten guys every that would get up every day and lecture and ask questions. 
it's not my style. My style is uh, try to be deadly in the, in the seminar room. And my uh, my own view about that was to uh, try to be a formative guy in the seminar. So that's where I spend my time working. I see. But I wouldn't have to impress anybody because uh, I didn't need to. Most war colleges, about half the people who are there don't need to be there. They'll never do jobs that will need what they learned there? Is that because they're the wrong people or because they just don't need 200? They don't need to have. Might there be a sort of building a mobilization cushion or a cushion maybe that some found, of them I found, I found if it's not half, it's a quarter of the people who weren't going anywhere after they got there. They get to go to the great Colonel and after that they were done. Now if you want to just keep on going, you know, the Energizer Colonel and uh, drive on for another five years of service, but doing jobs which I'd call nondescript, uh, then, then they were given an aggrandizement as opposed to a uh, further preparation for duties at a higher level. I mean, they just aren't going anywhere. At least in my class, they weren't going anywhere. Now, in my, in my particular class, I was trained for the next job I would have, oh, although I didn't know it at the time. It got into the fact that I ran the uh, seminar. There were, I don't know, 12 or 14 seminars, groups, and I ran one for the last segment. And the last segment had as its proposition to put together an Army program, including the fiduciary aspects of it. it. Turns out then I would go and run the Army program for the next three years. So I was trained, which the, the Army War College would want to be a place where you don't get any training. Right. Just follow me. They want to give you intellectual capacity to uh, to uh, take care of world events in the future, and in this case, serendipitously, but with malice aforethought, they uh, trained me for my next job. Which, if they had it to do over again, they'd make sure I didn't get trained for my next job because they have a scurry view of the future. But in this case, it worked nicely because I worked right into a job that I applied those same skills doing a uh, piece of work for the Secretary of the Army and for the Chief of Staff for the next three years. I would run the Army program. So it paid off in my case, big time. Fully equipped with uh, knowing all that. So having come from the Army staff, I had a good sense about what an Army staff did on the one hand. And uh, to matters associated with uh, how the Army program was built, that served my purposes nicely when I got to worship. But there were only a few of you who learned that, right? Well, everybody participated in the seminar, but I had—I was a group leader, so yeah. I had. But there were only like 14 people in the seminar. Yeah. No, every every everybody participated in that. There were 14 groups. Every every seminar, which presented an Army program, oh, I see. or a DOD program and an Army program. So everybody did that, but but not everybody. But I was the only guy that went from there to run the Army program. Right. right. I got you. got you. Students had a, every student had the same curriculum there. We had some electives, but relatively few electives. And they had washed out the uh, graduate program here, so you couldn't go to Chippenburg or GW or whatever. So never got an aggrandizement as a graduate period holder. Again, which stunted my growth. But I had one of those that had been better off. You might have amounted to something. Might have something. <laughs> I had a question in the back of my mind, but slipped out. I should write them down. On Leavenworth? Or on the, the work? Yeah, there's something on the work college. Yes, this is what it was. When um, you became uh, this perp, 
did you find out why 200 people were sent to the War College? No, it was a quota. See, you put 200 up there because it's sized for 200. If you put 100, it could be downsized, but uh, that would probably send to 200 now, right? With a smaller army? Yeah. You bet. Okay, well, maybe you might say something about it being a critical mass also, or it might just be a no, I think, I think the intent is right. The intent says we're going to select people who we believe will have promissory notes <laughs> for future service to the Army. But as soon as you say that there are going to be 200 or 188 of them, to be exact, there are going to be 188. The board will select 188. The board won't select 100 and report back to uh, the Department of the Army. Oh, by the way, we couldn't find 88 more that are worth the damn. So if you give them a quota to fill, the boards will fill the quota. Simple as that. So there isn't any reason for doing it, but... Well, I guess somebody counted jobs one time, but they haven't been counted lately. And they certainly haven't been counted since the downsizing. So now it is looked upon as a reward system. Yes, I thought, thought of that. It might be a... You wouldn't run a business that way. No. If you did, you would go back and, uh, and say, what am I, what am I, what's my value I get out of this investment that I pay in this guy 60000 a year to go to school for a year, plus all the infrastructure it takes to support him? given what he's going to do ahead of time. Now you say, well, geez, why didn't you challenge that as a desperate? And I said, well, because it's a reward system. And so if I went in there and said, let's cut the uh, four college graduates in half, then half of the people that think they're going to go to the war college because they think they have a high aspiration for future service would get cut off at the knees. and. You know, you'd pretty soon say, well, geez, there's an elitist uh, group to that. You didn't provide for late bloomers. Uh, and oh, by the way, uh, you've cut off part of the reward structure in the service. And all the answers would be, yeah, that's right. And so you pay a price for having 200 people go through when 100 probably would be just as good. Because you can look around at them and see them in class and know that their intellectual capacity isn't worth a damn. Yeah. They got there. Not about what's going to happen, because we don't write efficiency reports very well about what's going to happen. You got there because the guy has been the good soldier schmuck in the, in the, in the main. And so going through a selection process about what it is you can be good for in the future is very difficult for the Army to do that. Promotion boards have a tough time doing it. That's true. So it's, maybe it's better to train a bigger number than you need. Yeah, you know, so you train, them. but but when you get there, you look at them and you say, I wonder how you got here. What's he going to do when he gets out of here? So you shrug your shoulders and say, that's the system. I'm not against the system, I'm just saying the system has frailties. It's like promoting people to Brigadier General. Promoting people to Brigadier General is a big hurdle. And going in, you know, only half of them are going to get promoted to major term. Yes, this is the first time it's so, a reward. So right. half of them don't cut it going in. So that's part of the uh, neck down procedures that you got. You build a bigger base that uh, says some people grown to breed their generals are damn good colonels. They'll never be good breeders. You think they will because you've been ordered to remote to fill vacancies, but they're not going to mount a hill of beans. Peace or war. Yes, sir. Yeah, Doug Kennard once told me that the uh, uh, promotion system was organized to try to be sure that the ones who were selected were not any worse than the ones who were not, because there were so many good ones, uh, so many good colonels, in each year group, 
Oh yeah, if you give them a if you give an orders to promote thirty, there are a hundred that you can promote. The no sweat. Yeah, but what I would say to you, you can probably if you probably debriefed a board president, you would probably find that there's unanimity on the first ten. I mean absolute unanimity. It may not be in the same order, one, two, three, four, five, six, ten. But the first ten, everybody will say. Go for when you look, no, when you look at the votes, the top ten are the top ten. Then when you get down below that, then you begin to push and shove around because people view people differently. But the top ten are clearly the top ten. The guy told me who was on the board that I was selected to bring your journal on. He said, it was a big board. Is in the 60s in. Top 19 officers were on everybody's list. They were not in the same order, but they were all the top 19 from the top 19. So by that time, you know, you're able to, if you only had 19 to promote, you'd, you'd know who they are. But now when you get down the last third of it, they're probably another twice or three times that many, they could be just like the last third. So you now you're really trying to discriminate to make your quotas because there, there's 50 people to get 20 bills. That speaks well for the Army. It says that there are plenty of good people in there. Well, shall we quit? achieving what it is you're looking to achieve here. Yeah, I am. The more I think about it, the less likely I am to be a candidate for anything. But the more I the more I think about it, the more I you can you, what my view is you're interested in the personnel business and I think that's probably an interesting story. Personnel. I think I'm less interested. I think I have insights to tell about the personnel business. But there, but there are other people that have other insights that I think make, make it a story. It's about the Army's search for itself with people, about people. The Army's search for itself with respect to people. But I'm not a very interesting subject for a biography, you know, because I, you know, my exploits are relatively simplistic until you get to the grade of uh, Major General in terms of people stuff. And I mean, you know, there, there are no heroic exploits about going out being a euro in some other line of work. My, my general view is as a biography, it doesn't won't sell much. If you write a uh, learned piece of work on, on the story of the Army's people function, I think it's an interesting story. It's had a limited audience. but. Uh, I think if you look at, at periods of service like in uh, Vietnam or whatever, there's really not a story there. But I, th I think the Army, starting with Volar, well, the Army starting in the terrible tragedy of Vietnam and fragging and doping and smoking and all that stuff. Starting in that time frame and look, looking at the personnel system to today, the personnel to today, not the system, the personnel and the system to today, I think that is a story. 
and I don't think anybody has touched has come anywhere close to it yet. I agree with you. I think that that, in other words, how did we get the way we got in Vietnam? How, how did that come about? What are the inherent uh, actions or failure to act? that got us in that position in Vietnam. That's one. I'm, I'm trying to outline a storyline here. If I was an author, this is what I'd write. Second thing is that how did we begin to correct that? What were the series of actions to begin to correct that? was the mistake of Volar, which what was the impact of going from draft to Volar and the mistakes there about. Fourth is what role did OE play? What about the disaster of 1979 recruiting failure? The what? The disaster of 1979 recruiting failure. What about that? Right. How did we get it? I mean, what, what was going on there? Was Volar was an event in its own right? Then you had Bernie Rogers as a desperate and you had the beginning of OE. Then you had the debacle of 79, when Bernie is now the chief of staff, trying to figure out what to do about that, and, and before Shy gets there, Shy suffers through that and puts me out there. And then you have the, the renaissance of the people, the quality of people. Then you have a training renaissance, antecedents in 75. Right. But it doesn't come to fruition because Gorman is running ahead of the people. And I don't know how well you know Paul or not, but I don't know. Anymore. Paul had, had introduced self-paced training at a time we, the recruiting service was <laughs> delivering cat four people. He was running ahead of. You follow me? He was running. Could use it, yes. Theoretically, he was running ahead of the supply of people who could benefit from it. Benefit from it, right? Turmoil. Then you have the rejuvenation, of, or the, what I would say, the the rejuvenation of the. Uh, the doctrinal sense in there and its effect on people because now it begins to put missions of down as to what it is you're supposed to be doing that people then rally around that and they get the best out of the people they got. You follow me? But I mean, when the doctrine came out in the 70s, there weren't any people. I mean, the people were bereft of skill on the one hand, they were stupid on the other, and uh, then given the given them all this training doctor to go practice. I mean, they, they were given standards which they uh, could, simply couldn't achieve. That's the story. And nobody's done that story. That's, a, that's an exciting story about the confluence. If you, if, you, if you drew that out on a timeline, and looked at, at sort of put the date time groups on course of 20 years. I think you got a terrific story. Nobody's done that story. And boy, it is a uh, significant, it's made us the finest army in the world. I told Bernie Rogers the other day that I want to come by after Christmas and I want to interview him on how did he bite in the OE game. Now let me tell you the connection about that, the historically connection about that. 
I believe that the OE process, which he began, and he, I think he got that out of his association with captains of industry, specifically Galvin in Motorola. I don't know if you know this, but he and Galvin grew up together in the same cornfield in Kansas. Oh, I didn't know that. And Galvin went off to be the CEO of Motorola, and they kept up their relationship all during their adult life. But when he introduced that as the Desper and forced that down everybody's throat, and nobody liked it, nobody did. It forever changed us. You know what he gave us? Mrs. Thurman's hypothesis. You know what? It gave us the after action critique or after action D A A R. That's where it came from. I, well, I, I am convinced. I haven't I haven't got the connection tied down yet, but I am convinced that the OE process where you sort of had to take your clothes off in front of your peers and your boss, and the boss had to do it in front of his subordinates, broke down the barrier in rank so that for the good of the unit, we could tell one another the truth about the unit. And when the commander came in and we had the little OE session within the first 30 days after he got in there and the commanders and the subordinate commanders said, you know, geez, we got uh, problems here. We need to go solve that. And let's make a commitment to go do that. That gave people the courage then to embark upon the OE process called the after action review in a different format but gave you the capability to have a sergeant stand up and tell the battalion commander where he screwed up. Where he screwed up. Either one of them screwed up after a tactical exercise was run. No other army yet has been able to do that. Now it's beginning in the French army because young Mike Kirby over here is at the war college, used to be the OC at uh, the CMTC at Hohenfels, and they had a French unit come through, and they did that. He and the Frenchmen, Frenchmen were aghast that some lieutenant colonel would uh, ask some sergeant in the French army, uh, what did you do? In French, because Kirby speaks French. But, but when the division commander heard it for the first time, he said, I like that. So Kirby started it in the French Army. Huh? Yeah. Transplant. Yeah. So, my, but my point is, see, I can't tell you anything about the bad army of Vietnam. No. You me? I can't tell you a thing about the bad army in Germany. No. Now, if my brother were here, he would tell you about the race riots in Germany and all that kind of stuff that he was embroiled in and in the middle of one in downtown Mannheim and all that kind of stuff. But I can't tell you anything about it. Don't know anything about it. One, I wasn't in that army. Right. Well, I was in the headshed army. You can't be in all of them all the time. Yes, I, I was in the headshed army. But the story, in my view, is the story is the metamorphosis. Well, the story is how did you get in that jam hmm. in Vietnam? Right. That's one story. And then the other one how, how did you, get, you out get out of it? At the same time that you accomplished the miracle of the uh, moving from, from a draft to a volunteer army, then how did you get high quality people? And how did you turn them on through training? And, and they were able to accomplish the doctrine that you'd envisioned they would in a field battle in no time flat without, without going through a battle learning curve. See, in most cases, Units go into battle and they go through a battle learning curve. Right. They screw it up not, at first. Not in Desert Storm. And not in. Uh, Went straight in there and. Not in Just Cause. Took them apart. Yeah. Well, they had some learning time. Went on no, well, the learning time was done learning in TCs. Went, yeah. Right. That's where the learning curve went. So the more I think about, you know, it's sort of saying it's a fire, I guess. Uh, 
I'm not sure that I bring out the points that are useful at, at getting at what I think your bent is. If I look at the, I keep going back to your letter one, letter two, it still concentrates on the personnel side. Of those. And uh, I think the storyline is sort of what I've led you through. Well, it, okay. It, right. It might should go that way. What's your next date? What's good for you? My schedule is much more flexible than yours. <laughs> well, uh, next week. December of '92. That's okay. But that means clean. Clean the whistle. Okay. Ninth is okay. What day is it? We're on Tuesday? Yes. Do it on seventh. Do it on the eighth, do it on the ninth. Mm -hmm. Can't do it on the sixth, can't do it on the tenth. Seven? Yes. Is this a good time? Yeah. Is this a good place? Yeah. Do it at home? No. Fifth the forty second came in in uh, the last two weeks of April of sixty eight. Were you already? I thought maybe you were already in command of the time by then. Yeah, I was. Maybe that's not the right outfit. Then. It, it Doesn't sound a, right. It's a one five five toad outfit, and uh, see his report indicates that the advance party came in the thirteenth. No, not the outfit. Not the outfit. No. Came in maybe November? The outfit came in sometime like uh, October, November, something like that. I was in command of the battalion during the Tet Offensive, which took place in January of 68. You took over what, middle of the month, middle of January? I don't recall the date. I was Shortly before the Tet Offensive or a good while before? December, January, somewhere in there. I don't, I don't recall the dates of that. <coughs> the, uh, uh, That battalion had already come in, and it had come in from California, and there, the post out there, it either came in from uh, Irwin, or there's another one out there, which is a National Guard post, whose name escapes me at the moment. Probably find that out here.
Cena, Roberts, or Hunter Lincoln? Um, was it the National Guard outfit? No, it had been created from scratch, as far as I know. I mean, if it's antecedents, I couldn't tell you. about the uh, IG inspection on the 2nd and 35th, uh, the uh, 54th group, I don't know if it was your operation, so it doesn't very much describe it as, uh, I guess it's the 54th group, has passed quite satisfactorily. That's in the record? That's in the record. <laughs> well, the, uh, the uh, is this thing on? This thing's on. Sure. No, the, uh, the thing that's sort of comical about it is, I, from my perspective, is the idea of carrying out an IG inspection in the middle of a war struck me as a lieutenant colonel who didn't know any better as being a little bit farcical. And so, and I mean, unless there had been some serious uh, Malfeasance. I could see that if you had some serious malfeasance going along, why they didn't want to throw an IG on top of you to find out whether or not you ought to get relieved or not, that'd be one thing. But to go through the mechanics of an inspector general, which at the, in those days was uh, oriented on uh, maintenance and uh, and what I would call the classical inspector general routine of good order and discipline of the troops, and are, there, is, are they getting fed right, and is the morale right, and all that kind of stuff, you know. Maybe if there had been some serious breach of, uh, of etiquette somewhere down the line, or you weren't able to shoot bullets straight, or you'd had a morale problem going along, I could see an IG, but I, I got the notion this IG was to meet somebody's uh, goal of saying we are administering IGs in the theater. Whether that was, whether we got targeted because theoretically all 155 units had the capability to shoot nuclear weapons and obviously we didn't have any nuclear weapons in South Vietnam to my knowledge or the idea that we were going to maintain standards of, of proficiency in uh, shooting nuclear weapons, which was the furthest thing from laying down harassing and interdiction fires against the uh, Viet Cong or NVA or whoever, or during the Tet Offensive. That whole notion was a strange one to me. So it was, uh, you know, you go through the uh, motions, if somebody sends down an inspection team on top of it, you go through the motions and you do what you're asked to do. In the two cases I cited, just two of the findings were, one, they were going to deadline half of my five-ton uh, ammo trucks, which instead of having five tons of ammo, had ten tons of ammo on because of uh, welded steering arm brackets. Welding steering arm brackets, in my book, was uh, a notion that uh, you had a very, very uh, functional maintenance chief. The warrant officer knew what his business was. He was trying to keep the stuff rolling. In, uh, in the case of trying to maintain nuclear weapons proficient, and incidentally, we weren't going to get any new steering arm brackets anytime soon, so when the IG left, all the vehicles rolled right along doing what they were supposed to do. Yeah, maybe it was a safety hazard, and we, we should have been more uh, discerning about that, but by you know, I didn't spend a whole lot of time chasing uh, steering arm brakes. You didn't have any fail, did you? Well, I don't recall them failing. They may have, but I don't recall them failing. We didn't have any terrible accidents as a result thereof. So it's one of those calculated risks you run in a wartime situation to keep the uh, ammo fed to the troops. Uh, on the other hand, the one about the uh, maintaining nuclear weapons proficiency, which would uh, have meant that you had both an FDC proficiency to make, Fire Direction Center proficiency to make, uh, to, to uh, continue, as well as a, uh, a notion of uh, 
the people that had to do the assembly work, well, there wasn't any school to maintain those proficiencies in theater, and the only place you could go and do it were if you, they said we could go to uh, Korea to do it. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of one five five times in Korea. And yeah, and I said, you know, I just said, Jesus, thanks a lot. I really appreciate that. Drive along, do all, do good work, excel in every way. And I forgot it. I mean, I, it's one of those things, one of those humorous things I look back on is saying, uh, in those days, they didn't have anything else to inspect about. So, I mean, I, they went around looking for things like that. Now, maybe that made its way back to Washington somehow or another, and uh, maybe somebody made a big decision at the four-star level that said, geez, I don't think we're going to do that, or, or if they did, they didn't send me any quotas to go to Korea. I mean, the troops would have loved to go to Korea. Taking an R&R &R from uh, Vietnam to Korea in order to get to go to nuke school? Got to be kidding me. So, I mean, it was, it's a laugher. And so one of those things that sort of says, what's the lesson out of that for uh, leadership in the future? And that is to say that we won't have to worry about that anymore because we've taken the nukes away from the Army, which is a great deal. Having screwed around with their weapons in uh, Germany with the Honest John and, and the possibility of having Adam required to train for them or with them in uh, 155 units later on, I'm glad the Army is not saddled with that responsibility any further. It's a victory for the demise of the Cold War. Yes, that was a very tense business. Well, I mean, it wasn't like I didn't know something about it. I mean, I'd spent 20 months in the Honest John business, and so I knew a lot about nuclear weapons assembly and passing uh, technical proficiency inspections and all that kind of business. And idea that we were going to use any was as was as far-fetched as you could get it and uh, you say well gee whiz maybe the Chinese would have come well the Chinese uh, can be taken on by some other method but not by 155 shooting uh, nukes in South Vietnam it's just a preposterous notion it's really an extraordinary thing and I wondered if it stuck when you went to talk to Colonel Morris what was the outcome forget it I wonder who, did the IG team come from the States or from? I don't know where the IG team, it may have been the USARV IG team first uh, right. knock around in, in uh, the artillery of two field force. Where it came from, I can't tell you. Could have been a MACV team, I don't know. I didn't ask you about NCOs. 67, 68, there probably still were a few professional NCOs around, or at least your sergeant major. Oh, yeah, dynamite NCOs. Uh, I had one sergeant major that crapped out on me, and he was uh, shacked up with a, a local, and we took care of his uh, career. On the other hand, the next guy that came in was a terrific sergeant major, later became a division artillery sergeant major, a guy named Charlie Theriax, now retired Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Uh, but those... Uh, the NCOs were terrific, and uh, I mean, I, I just look at uh, what I would call the ability to uh, keep the guns in action on a distributive basis. You know, one thing is to have all your guns sort of centrally managed and centrally located. Another one is having everything decentralized, uh, miles apart, the uh, difficulty which meant improvisation. One case down in the uh, uh, south of Saigon, we were firing a tremendous number of weapon or a tremendous number of rounds down there. Ended up blowing hydraulic lines. Guys repaired hydraulic lines on the spot, poured water in the hydraulic lines to to uh, get through it because we'd leaked so much hydraulic fluid. So the improvisation was terrific, and uh, maintenance was maintenance people were terrific. Uh, Gun crew guys were terrific, uh, very receptive to uh, doing what you asked them to do. I had some rules out, for example, I mentioned Killer Jr., which we invoked. I picked it up from 105 Outfits. Uh, the business of digging in with uh, culvert material, steel culvert material, overheaded with uh, three layers of sandbags before you went to sleep at night, uh, or daytime for that matter. and. Uh, I was in Vietnam 
at that period, including the Tet Offensive, when the Malays that later came on U.S. Uh, military forces was not present, particularly in the unit I was in. Nor did I know anything about that. That just was as far into my uh, knowledge base at that time. I'm not denigrating that it happened later. And I really believe the personnel, I go back and say again, I think the personnel policies, policies were awry and contributed significantly to the demise of the American Army in Vietnam through uh, one, the 12 to 13 month tours on the one hand, and secondly with, uh, as opposed to the duration, and secondly with the uh, constant disruption of the unit with replacements. How about the command tour? 